So thanks for the invitation to uh, talk about the uh, molecular test for mycoplasma genitalium resistance uh, to first and second line therapy. For those of you who know me, uh, you know that this is something that I've been working with for quite some time and um, it's really something that I find very important. So before we start my disclosures, the topics of my talk today will be first a brief introduction. Uh, then something about mycoplasma genitalium, uh, macrolide resistance, the mechanisms, the prevalence and how we detect it. Then we'll switch to um, the second line antimicrobials and how we can detect fluoroquinolone resistance. Uh, and I will like to show you some results of our evaluation of the PAR-C assay from Speedex. Uh, then I'll briefly talk about resistance guided therapy because this is the potential of these tests. Uh, and then the grumpy old man's take on do's and don'ts in uh, mycoplasma genitalium uh, diagnostics and end up with some, uh, hopefully some conclusions and, and future perspectives. Uh, mycoplasma genitalium is a relatively new organism. It was isolated in 1980 by this guy, David Taylor Robinson. He is holding a squash uh, with a similar form as the mycoplasma genitalium cell as, as a flask formed mycoplasma species uh, and it was detected in uh, urogenital samples by PCR in 1991 and two, two years later it, it was associated with non gonococcal urotritis and I think it's safe to say that today it is an established cause of sexually transmitted infections and it's only second to chlamydia trachomatis in, uh, in prevalence. The big issue with mycoplasma genitalium is the treatment because even if mycoplasma genitalium is susceptible in vitro to doxycycline, then uh, this antibiotic will only eradicate about 30% of the infections. Uh, and although the patients will experience some uh, temporary improvement because the mycoplasma genitalium load is, is suppressed, then it's still uh, something that makes them come back to the physician again when the treatment has stopped. So quite early on, we found that uh, acetromycin was a better compound and uh, it was used in a five-day dosage similar to that used in uh, pneumonia treatment. Uh, but it also became clear that about uh, 5 to 15 percent of the patients uh, failed treatment, especially if you use the one gram treatment. And then uh, many of those were resistant when they came back. Uh, and this is what is shown on this uh, graph of studies over time, where in the early days the treatment efficacy was around 85 to uh, 95 percent. But then after 2009, where, where um, macrolide resistance was spreading, then the treatment efficacy uh, uh, gradually uh, declined quite significantly. These mutations are quite simple. They are caused by uh, mutations in the 23S ribosomal RNA gene at this position, the, t the 2058 and 2059. So it's similar to many other bacteria, but since mycoplasma genitalium has only one uh, operon of a, a ribosomal RNA, then one event will change the um, susceptibility pattern quite dramatically. There's a lot of resistance, but there's also a lot of difference between the resistance in different countries. I just made France red uh, according to Cécile Bibert's uh, presentation uh, on, on Friday. Uh, but otherwise you can see that in Scandinavia, where uh, we've been studying this for, for quite some time, in Denmark and Norway we have more than 50% macrolide resistance. But the puzzling thing is that in Sweden they have less than 20%. And my um, uh, conclusion on that is that this is because in Sweden they have kept the treatment of chlamydia and, and unspecific urotritis to doxycycline uh, all the way until uh, today, uh, whereas in Denmark and Norway we switched to acetromycin as soon as that became available and this is what we are paying the price for now. So in the European guidelines, it's recommended that detection of macrolide resistance should be done on all positive samples to guide treatment. And this is in order to shorten the duration of infectiousness because you can treat the patients correctly from the beginning. 
but certainly also to limit the use of moxifloxacin uh, because this is a much more toxic uh, drug and uh, we want to preserve it to where it's definitely needed. And there's a lot of different approaches to detect these mutations from the Sanger sequencing originally described and now uh, to a cartridge-based uh, MG detection with resistance uh, which is shown on, on that screen over there and which uh, will be presented in more detail at the uh, CF8 uh, symposium tomorrow. But in short, it's combining two very good ideas, the resistance plus assay with the CF8 Genex per flexible cartridge format so that you can have a very easy to use a detection of, of uh, macrolide resistance together with the organism. And it's extremely sensitive <coughs> with an analytical sensitivity uh, around 10 to 60 genome copies per milliliter. So it's more than five times as sensitive as our reference assay. And it's even more pronounced in the uh, UTM uh, transport medium for swaps, where it's up to, to tenfold better. But macrolide resistance is a problem, uh, but now we are also getting problems with uh, moxifloxacin, which is our only second drug available. Um, and this is because of mutations, and this is a meta-analysis of the studies showing that there's a decline in the uh, treatment efficacy of moxifloxacin over time. And my prediction is that it's going to end up like it did with, uh, with macrolides, but sooner or later we will end in a situation where we cannot treat without resistance guided treatment. The mutations that lead to this resistance are very uh, simple actually. They're point mutations in the PARC gene in the quinolone resistance determining region, uh, predominantly S83, I, and R are causing resistance, and uh, also uh, in, uh, in, in uh, a relatively high level resistance in D87 as well, and where you, where you can see it's N and A and Y mutations that are causing MICs that makes uh, it inefficient to use moxifloxacin. Fluoroquinolone resistance have been detected uh, mainly by Sanger sequencing, but that's a time consuming and uh, a difficult method to use on a routine basis, so we were uh, quite interested in trying the SpeedX beta version of the PARC qPCR. And this assay is a two well multiplex qPCR assay where MGPA PCR is used in both wells because we need that to normalize the CT values uh, which are used to calculate resistance uh, with the other uh, markers. <coughs> and in well one, there is a, uh, a color for the S83N mutation, uh, which is of unknown significance. Actually, uh, the, the four strains that have been isolated and um, where we have uh, um, MICs available suggest that it's without any importance. Uh, it should be treatable, but there must be a reason why it's, uh, why it's selected for. So it's, I think it's a very good uh, point in having that as a separate uh, channel. The uh, second channel is detecting the S83R and I, the high level resistance markers, and then there's an internal control in the assay. In well two, uh, the mutations in position 87 are detected, and these are causing medium to high level resistance as well. And it's, it's using the standard 5 microliter uh, input template, uh, the same as is used for the uh, resistance plus assay, so it could use the same template as has been tested in, in that assay. We uh, used uh, uh, our uh, strain collection to select uh, 23 mycoplasm genitalium isolates uh, where we had a known PARC sequence <coughs> and we standardized them to an inoculum of about 500 genome copies per uh, reaction to, to keep it in the, in the low end and a, a realistic um, concentration. We had five wild types and five with silent mutations or mutations outside of the quinolone resistance determining region uh, and they were all correctly identified as susceptible. Uh, the resistant ones were also correctly identified, the S83N, which we don't think is too important, but it was still correctly identified. 
the S83i, we had eight strains of those, and one with S83r. We had two strains with D87n um, and one with D27y, and they were also correctly identified. So very promising uh, with, with the standard strains. But the real test is to use it on the clinical samples because they vary a lot in their, um, in their genome uh, load. Uh, so we selected uh, 46 samples where we had already collected PAR-C sequence data by, by Sanger sequencing. And of these 46, there were four that produced no amplicon of the MPPA target, uh, but still had a positive internal control, so they were probably below the detection limit. And we know that for a fact that, that we can often see a plus minus reaction with mycoplasma genetization because many of the clinical samples are low positives. We had uh, five with wild type, 27 with silent mutation, so outside the quinolone resistance, and they were all correctly identified. Then we had three with S83N correctly identified, uh, one with S83I and three with S83R and correctly identified, and then two with D87N and four with D87Y, again full score. So it appeared to be very, uh, very efficient to pick up these mutations even in low positive clinical samples. Uh, the limitations in, in, in my point of view is that we actually had a PAR-C par sequence from these samples determined by Sanger sequencing. So we had 9% that failed the MPPA assay, and of course these can be rerun and, and may come up as positive, but we may foresee that there is a, a, a limitation in the, in the sensitivity in low positive samples. And then the software that is uh, used for interpretation needs to be uh, automated because as we did it now, it was a simple manual um, comparison between the CT values of the uh, mutation targets and the MDPA targets. And, uh, and we need a better statistical background to say what, what that difference should be because we had a CT difference of uh, above 10 for all the non-target mutations, uh, whereas the target mutations had, had less than 6.3, uh, most of them around 2. So uh, probably we need to work out where exactly the, the cutoff should be. But having these tools available makes us in a much better position to do a uh, good job in treating the patients. And uh, the idea of using resistance-guided therapy uh, came from, from Melbourne in Australia, where they used the SpeedX assay already for macrolide resistance mutations. And they uh, <coughs> decided to look at what happened if they pre-treated the patients with uh, doxycycline while they were waiting for the results, and then uh, went on to, get, to give the patients the correct antibiotic uh, immediately instead of waiting for treatment failures to change the, the treatment. Uh, they had one, 244 MD positive patients. Uh, and uh, while they were waiting for the results, they were treated with doxycycline. Uh, and as you can see, the load of mycoplasma genitalium uh, decreased dramatically. Uh, this population had a very high proportion of resistant uh, strains. 68% uh, had uh, macrolide resistant infections. Those that had a macrolide susceptible infection were treated with a quite large dose of azithromycin, uh, actually double of the Scandinavian dose, but they had a very good cure rate of, 97, uh, of 95%. And the four that persisted, uh, two of them could actually be excluded because one was a clear reinfection and one was actually uh, resistant before treatment but, but was missed in the initial uh, screening. So only two patients uh, uh, selected resistance meaning that this is much lower than what we usually see with treatment. And uh, they compared it to an earlier clinical evaluation where they gave one gram of azithromycin, which was selected resistance in 18%. Uh, and with the extended azithromycin, it had 12% resistance selection. So much better if we uh, target the organism after they have been sort of weakened with, azithromycin, uh, with, with doxycycline. The macrolide resistant strains were treated with um, 
uh, cetafloxacin, which is a Japanese registered um, uh, fluoroquinolone, which is more active than moxifloxacin. <laughs> Uh, and they had a 92% cure rate, which was significantly better than what they would have, have expected uh, from the moxifloxacin, because that would be expected to be only around 20%. And this is probably because cetafloxacin retains activity in some of the D87 mutations uh, that can actually be detected by the uh, PAR-C assay in, in the future. It wasn't a very a friendly drug to use, 12% had diarrhea and 5% developed tendinitis symptoms, so it's not a nice uh, antibiotic to use and it's very expensive uh, compared to moxifloxacin and it's, uh, to my knowledge, not registered uh, anywhere in Europe, so it would be difficult to, to source it. So when fluoroquinolones fail, then the only option we have left is pristinamycin, which is streptogramming. And unfortunately, it's only registered in France, so we have to get it on a special permit in other European countries. And in the US, it's almost impossible to, to import it. So they are even in a worse situation that, than we are here in, in Europe. The problem with pristinamycin is that it's a, a relatively complex treatment with four times daily dosing uh, for, for at least 10 days. And as I said, it was difficult to source. And then it's also expensive because you use a max dose. Uh, on the good side is that it uh, has relatively few side effects and it's considered safe in pregnancy. So actually it can be used in, in pregnant women with macrolide resistant infections where you don't want to give moxifloxacin. Uh, on the downside again, uh, it's only about 75% cure rate. So we still have about 25% of the patients where we don't know what to treat them uh, with. So my recommendations for diagnostic testing is first of all to use an assay that allow macrolide resistance testing because that will direct your treatment immediately. But then you should also pay attention to the limit of detection uh, because many MP infections are with a low uh, organism load so it's important to have a sensitive assay. And then you should use an assay that has been thoroughly validated and published by independent researchers because there's a lot of assays out there that haven't even been uh, published in, in, uh, in independent uh, publications. On the other hand, you shouldn't screen MG in asymptomatic individuals because at the moment we actually don't know if we are doing more good than harm by treating these resistant infections, uh, pouring moxifloxacin out over 20% or, or more of the, uh, of the infected um, people is probably going to cause other problems and uh, at this stage we do not recommend screening for MG. Uh, the, you should never use a, a highly multiplex assay because they are usually less sensitive than the singleplex assays. Uh, and many of them include also targets for urea plasmas and mycoplasma hominis. And with that knowledge you will give to the clinicians, it will always lead to overtreatment. And it has never been documented that treatment helped these patients. So I definitely think that, that they should not be, be used. So in conclusion, I think that mycoplasma genitalium uh, is the second most bacterial STI, but the diagnosis is challenging because we have a low bacterial load. Treatment is complicated due to resistance emerging. Uh, macrolide resistance testing should be a part of all diagnostic testing and the new cartridge-based MG detecting is really an inter interesting uh, development. Uh, moxifloxacin is uh, emerging uh, and I think that we will clearly see that coming when we start testing on a broader scale. Uh, now that we have assays available. So we have to develop smart ways of testing by molecular methods because that is indicated in patients that have moxifloxacin treatment failure because we want to check that they are not uh, reinfected because then they can still be treated with relatively inexpensive moxifloxacin. But we should also consider using uh, such tests in infections acquired in high uh, risk areas on high risk populations. And then I think it's important that we establish uh, surveillance. Uh, I think the French example given uh, by Cécile Bibiard was very excellent, uh, showing that actually already 7.5% of the 
infections in France were multi-drug resistant. And with that, I would like to thank my uh, staff, uh, Suella, Susanne and Mette, who did all the hard work, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.